Welcome to Dwella of the Dark. We are a channel honoring the yellowed and blackened bones of many prominent authors. We will be digging up several obscure, strange, and forgotten authors who influenced many of the great horror, science fiction, and fantasy writers to date. More tales of the horrifying, obscure, strange, and forgotten are climbing out of the tombs. Check out our links below for more information. Subscribe, comment, like, donate, or I'll send the devil of Black Bayou to rip your head off as we did the like button. Send us ghoulish delights for the Skull and Bones collection. Your pound of writer's flesh will feed our ghouls for now. Children of Horror, Legion of Ghouls. Tonight, we present our Jack the Ripper collection, A Night with the Ripper. You better bring your guts when you listen to these. We are dedicating this horrific collection to that charming cannibal, Thomas Swafford, the lurking creeper, ARW, CWB. The Dark Sorcerer, Archie Sinclair. The Hellish Cat Lover, Dillian Stanchev. The Evil Siren, who made my ears bleed, Lisa. The Ravenous Wraith, Alex Davies. Master Sorcerer, Max Scherzer. The Creeping Crawling, Spider Line. And the Father of the Devilish Nocturnus, the Necromancer Dragon. Brandon J. Crookston, devilishly devoted to horror. May your souls always be a toy for Juliet by Robert Block. Juliet entered her bedroom smiling and a thousand Juliets smiled back at her for all the walls were paneled with mirrors, and the ceiling was set with inlaid panes that reflected her image. Wherever she glanced, she could see the blonde curls framing the sensitive features of a face that was a radiant amalgam of both child and angel, a striking contrast to the rich, ripe revelation of her body in the filmy robe. But Juliet wasn't smiling at herself. She smiled because she knew that grandfather was back and he'd brought her another toy. In just a few moments, it would be decontaminated and delivered and she wanted to be ready. Juliet turned the ring on her finger and the mirrors dimmed. Another turn would darken the room entirely. A twist in the opposite direction would bring them blazing into brilliance. It was all a matter of choice. But then, that was the secret of life. To choose for pleasure. And what was her pleasure tonight? Juliet advanced to one of the mirror panels and passed her hand before it. The glass slid to one side, revealing the niche behind it. The coffin-shaped opening in the solid rock with the boot and thumb screws set at the proper heights. For a moment, she hesitated. She hadn't played that game in years. Another time, perhaps, Juliet waved her hand and the mirror moved to cover the opening again. She wandered along the row of panels, gesturing as she walked, pausing to inspect what was behind each mirror in turn. Here was the rack, there the stocks, with the barbed whips resting 
against the dark stained wood. And here was the dissecting table, hundreds of years old, with its quaint instruments. Behind the next panel, the electrical prods and wires that produced such weird grimaces and contortions of agony to say nothing of screams. Of course, the screams didn't matter in a soundproofed room. Juliet moved to the side wall and waved her hand again. The obedient glass slid away and she stared at a plaything she'd almost forgotten. It was one of the first things grandfather had ever given her, and it was very old, almost like a mummy case. What had he called it? The Iron Maiden of Nuremberg, that was it, with the sharpened steel spikes set inside the lid. You chained a man inside, and you turned the little crank that closed the lid ever so slowly, and the spikes pierced the wrist and the elbows, the ankles and the knees, the groin and the eyes. You had to be careful not to get excited and turn too quickly or you'd spoil the fun. Grandfather had shown her how it worked. The first time he brought her a real live toy. But then Grandfather had shown her everything. He'd taught her all she knew, for he was very wise. He'd even given her her name. Juliet, from one of the old-fashioned printed books he'd discovered by the philosopher the Sod. Grandfather had brought the books from the past, just as he'd brought the playthings for her. He was the only one who had access to the past, because he owned the Traveler. The Traveler was a very ingenious mechanism capable of attaining vibrational frequencies which freed it from the time bind. At rest, it was just a big square box-like shape the size of a small room. But when Grandfather took over the controls and the oscillation started, the box would blur and disappear. It was still there, Grandfather said. At least the matrix remained as a fixed point in space and time. But anything or anyone within the square could move freely into the past to wherever the controls were programmed. Of course, they would be invisible when they arrived, but that was actually an advantage, particularly when it came to finding things and bringing them back. Grandfather had brought back some very interesting objects from almost mythical places. The Great Library of Alexandria the Pyramid of Cheops, the Kremlin, the Vatican, Fort Knox, all the storehouses of treasure and knowledge which existed thousands of years ago. He liked to go to that part of the past, the period before the thermonuclear wars and the robotic ages and collect things of course, books and jewels and medals were useless, except to an antiquarian. But Grandfather was a romanticist and loved the olden times. 
It was strange to think of him owning the Traveler. But of course, he hadn't actually created it. Juliet's father was really the one who built it and grandfather took possession of it after her father died. Juliet suspected grandfather had killed her father and mother when she was just a baby, which she could never be sure. Not that it mattered. Grandfather was always very good to her. And besides, soon he would die and she'd own the Traveler herself. They used to joke about it frequently. I've made you into a monster, he'd say. And someday you'll end up by destroying me. After which, of course, you'll go on to destroy the entire world, or what little remains of it. Weren't you afraid? She'd tease. Certainly not. That's my dream. The destruction of everything. An end to all this sterile decadence. Do you realize that at one time there were more than three billion inhabitants on this planet? And now, less than three thousand. Less than 3,000 shut up inside these domes, prisoners of themselves, and sealed away forever, thanks to the sins of the fathers, who poisoned not only the outside world, but outer space by meddling with the atomic order of the universe. Humanity is virtually extinct already. You will merely hasten the finale. But couldn't we all go back to another time in the Traveler? She asked. Back to what time? The continuum is changeless. One event leads inexorably to another. All links in a chain which binds us to the present and its inevitable end in destruction. We'd have temporary individual survival, yes, but to no purpose. And none of us are fitted to survive in a more primitive environment. So let us stay here and take what pleasure we can from the moment. My pleasure is to be the sole user and possessor of the Traveler and yours, Juliet. Grandfather laughed then. <laughs> they both laughed <laughs> because they knew what her pleasure was. Juliet killed her first toy when she was 11, a little boy. It had been brought to her as a special gift from grandfather, from somewhere in the past for elementary sex play, but it wouldn't cooperate and she lost her temper and beat it to death with a steel rod. So grandfather brought her an older toy with brown skin and it cooperated very well but in the end she tired of it and one day when it was sleeping in her bed she tied it down and found a knife experimenting a little before it died Juliet discovered new sources of pleasure and of course, Grandfather found out. That's when he'd christened her Juliet. He seemed to approve most highly. And from then on, he brought her the playthings she kept 
behind the mirrors in her bedroom and on his restless rovings into the past he brought her new toys being invisible he could find them for her almost anywhere on his travels all he did was to use a stunner and transport them when he returned of course each toy had to be very carefully decontaminated the past was teeming with strange microorganisms but once the toys were properly antiseptic they were turned over to Juliet for her pleasure and during the past seven years she had enjoyed herself it was always delicious this moment of anticipation before a new toy arrived what would it be like grandfather was most considerate mainly he made sure that the toys he brought her could speak and understand English or English as they used to call it in the past verbal communication was often important particularly if Juliet wanted to follow the precepts of the philosopher the sod and enjoy some form of sex relation for going on to keener pleasures but there was still the guessing beforehand would this toy be young or old wild or tame male or female she'd had all kinds and every possible combination sometimes she kept them alive for days before tiring of them or before the subtleties of which she was capable caused them to expire at other times she wanted it to happen quickly tonight for example she knew she could be soothed only by the most primitive and direct action. Once Juliet realized this, she stopped playing with her mirror panels and went directly to the big bed. She pulled back the coverlet and groped under the pillow until she felt it. Yes, it was still there the big knife with the long cruel blade she knew what she would do now take the toy to bed with her and then at precisely the proper moment combine her pleasures if she could time her knife thrust she shivered with anticipation then Patience. What kind of toy would it be? She remembered the suave, cool one. Benjamin Bathurst was his name. An English diplomat from the time of what grandfather called the Napoleonic Wars. Oh, he'd been suave and cool enough until she beguiled him with her body into the bed and there'd been that American aviatrix from slightly later on in the past and once as a very special treat the entire crew of a sailing vessel called the Marie Celeste they had lasted for weeks strangely enough she even read about some of her toys afterwards because when grandfather approached them with his stunner and brought them here they disappeared forever from the past and if they were in any way known or important in their time such disappearances were noted in some of grandfather's books had accounts of the mysterious vanishing, which 
which took place and was, of course, never explained. How delicious it all was! Juliet patted the pillow back into place and slid the knife under it. She couldn't wait now. What was delaying things? She forced herself to move to a vent and depress the sprayer, shedding her robe as the perfumed mist bathed her body. It was the final allurement. But why didn't her toy arrive? Suddenly, grandfather's voice came over the auditor. I'm sending you a little surprise, dearest. That's what he always said. It was part of the game. Juliet depressed. The communicator toggled. Don't tease, she begged. Tell me, what's it like? An English man. Late Victorian era. Very prim and proper by the looks of him. Young, handsome, passable. Grandfather chuckled. <laughs> Your appetites betray you, dearest. Who is it? Someone from the books? I wouldn't know the name. We found no identification during the decontamination but from his dress and manner and the little black bag he carried when I discovered him so early in the morning. I judge him to be a physician returning from an emergency call. Juliet knew about physicians from her reading, of course, just as she knew what Victorian meant. Somehow, the combination seemed exactly right. Prim and proper? <laughs> she giggled. Then I'm afraid it's due for a shock. Grandfather laughed. <laughs> you have something in mind, I take it? Yes. Can I watch? Please, not this time. Very well. Don't be mad, darling. I love you. Juliet switched off just in time, too, because the door was opening and the toy came in. She stared at it, realizing that Grandfather had told the truth. The toy was a male of 30 odd years, attractive, but by no means handsome. It couldn't be in that dark garb and those ridiculous side whiskers. There was something almost depressingly refined and mannered about it, an air of embarrassed repression. And of course, when it caught sight of Juliet in her revealing robe and the bed surrounded by mirrors, it actually began to blush. That reaction won Juliet completely, a blushing Victorian with the build of a bull. And unaware that this was the slaughterhouse, it was so amusing she couldn't restrain herself. She moved forward at once and put her arms around it. Who, who are you? Where am I? The usual questions voiced in the usual way. Ordinarily, Juliet would have amused herself by parrying with answers designed to tantalize and titillate her victim. But tonight, she felt 
and urgency which only increased as she embraced the toy and pressed it back toward the waiting bed. The toy began to breathe heavily, responding, but it was still bewildered. Tell me, I don't understand. Am I alive or is this heaven? Juliet's robe fell open as she lay back. You're alive, darling, she murmured. Wonderfully alive, she laughed <laughs> as she began to prove the statement. But closer to heaven than you think. And to prove that statement, her free hand slid under the pillow and groped for the waiting knife. But the knife wasn't there anymore. Somehow it had already found its way into the toy's hand. And the toy wasn't prim and proper any longer. Its face was something glimpsed in nightmare. Just a glimpse before the blinding blur of the knife blade as it came down again and again and again. The room, of course, was soundproof and there was plenty of time. They didn't discover what was left of Juliet's body for several days. Back in London, after the final mysterious murder in the early morning hours, they never did find Jack the Ripper. A Most Unusual Murder by Robert Block. Only the dead know Brooklyn. Thomas Wolfe said that, and he's dead now, so he ought to know. London, of course, is a different story. At least that's the way Hillary Kane thought of it. Not as a story, perhaps, but rather as an old fashioned, outsized, picaresque novel in which every street was a chapter crammed with characters and incidents of its own. Each block a page, each structure a separate paragraph unto itself within the sprawling, tangled plot. Such was Hillary Kane's concept of the city, and he knew it well. Over the years, he strolled the pavements, reading the city sentence by sentence, until every line was familiar. He'd learned London by heart. And that's why he was so startled when, one bleak afternoon in November, he discovered the shop in Saxe-Coburg Square. I'll be damned, he said. Probably, lest the woods, his companion, took the edge off the affirmation with an indulgent smile. What's the problem? This. Kane gestured toward the tiny window of the establishment nestled inconspicuously between two residential relics of Victoria's day. An antique place. Woods nodded. At the rate they are springing up there must be at least one for every tourist in London. But not here, Cain frowned. I happened to have come by this way less 
than a week ago, and I'd swear there was no shop in the square. Then it must have opened since. The two men moved up to the entrance, glancing through the display window in passing. Gaines' frown deepened. You call this new? Look at the dust on those goblets. Playing detective again, eh? Woods shook his head. Trouble with you, Hillary, is that you have too many hobbies. He glanced across the square as a chill wind heralded the coming of twilight. Getting light, we'd better move along. Not until I find out about this. Gain was already opening the door and Woods sighed. <sighs> the game is afoot, I suppose. All right, let's get it over with. The shop bell tinkled and the two men stepped inside. The door closed, the tinkling stopped, and they stood in the shadows and the silence. But one of the shadows was not silent. It rose from behind the single counter in the small space before the rear wall. Good afternoon, gentlemen, said the shadow, and switched on an overhead light. It cast a dim nimbus over the countertop and gave dimension to the shadow revealing the substance of a diminutive figure with an unremarkable face beneath a balding brow. Kane addressed the proprietor. Mind if we have a look? Is there any special area of interest? The proprietor gestured toward the shelves lining the wall behind him. Books, maps, china, crystal? Not really, Kane said. It's just that I'm always curious about a new shop of this sort. The proprietor shook his head, begging your pardon, but it's hardly knew. Woods glanced at his friend with a barely suppressed smile, but Kane ignored him. Odd, Kane said. I've never noticed this place before. Quite so. I've been in business a good many years, but this is a new location. Now it was Kane's turn to glance quickly at Woods, and his smile was not suppressed, but Woods was already eyeing the artifacts on display, and after a moment Kane began his own inspection. Peering at the shelving beneath the glass counter, he made a rapid inventory. He noted a boudoir lamp with a beaded fringe, a lavalier, a tray of pearly buttons, a Derbar souvenir program, and a framed and inscribed photograph of Matilda Alice Victoria Wood, a.k.a. Bella Delmer, a.k.a. Marie Lloyd. There was a miscellany of old jewelry, hunting watches, pewter mugs, napkin rings, a toy bank in the shape of a miniature crystal palace, and a display poster 
of a formidably moustached Lord Kitchener with his gloved finger extended in a gesture of imperious command. It was, he decided, the mixture as before. Nothing unusual and most of it like the Kitchener poster. Not even properly antique, but merely outmoded. Those fans on the bottom shelf, for example, and the silk toppers, the opera glasses, the black bag in the far corner, covered with what was once called American cloth. Something about the phrase caused Kane to stoop and make a closer inspection. American cloth, dusty now, but once shiny, like the tarnished silver nameplate identifying its owner. He read the inscription. J. Ridley, M. D. Kane looked up, striving to conceal his sudden surge of excitement. Impossible. It couldn't be. And yet it was. Keeping his voice and gesture carefully casual, he indicated the bag to the proprietor. A medical kit? Yes, I imagine so. Might I ask where you acquired it? The little man shrugged. Hard to remember. In this line one picks up the odd item here and there over the years. Might I have a look at it, please? The elderly proprietor lifted the bag to the countertop. Wood stared at it, puzzled, but Kane ignored him, his gaze intent on the nameplate below the lock. Would you mind opening it? He said. I'm afraid I don't have a key. Gain reached out and pressed the lock. It was rusted but firmly fixed. Frowning, he lifted the bag and shook it gently. Something jiggled inside, and as he heard the click of metal against metal, his elation peaked. Somehow, he suppressed it as he spoke. How much are you asking? The proprietor was equally emotionless. Not for sale. What? Sorry, sir. It's against my policy to dispose of blind items. And since there's no telling what's inside. Look, it's only an old medical bag. I hardly imagine it contains the crown jewels. In the background, Woods snickered, but the proprietor ignored him. Granted. He said, but one can't be certain of the contents. Now, the little man lifted the bag, and once again, there was a clicking sound. Coins, perhaps? Probably just surgical instruments, Kane said impatiently. Why don't you force the lock? and settle the matter. Oh, I couldn't do that. It would destroy its value. What value? Kane's guard was down now. He knew he'd made a tactical error, but he couldn't help himself. The proprietor smiled. I told you. The bag is not for sale. Everything 
has its price. Kane's statement was a challenge, and the proprietor's smile broadened as he met it. One hundred pounds. A hundred pounds for that? Woods grinned, then gaped at Kane's response. Done and done. But, sir. For answer, Kane drew out his wallet and extracted five twenty-pound notes, placing them on the countertop. He lifted the bag and moved toward the door. Woods followed hastily, turning to close the door behind him. The proprietor gestured, Wait, come back. But Kane was already hurrying down the street, clutching the black bag under his arm. He was still clutching it half an hour later, as Woods moved with him into the spacious study of Kane's flat, overlooking the verdant vista of Catagon Square. Dappled splotches of sunlight reflected from the gleaming oilcloth as Kane set the bag on the table and carefully wiped away the film of dust with a dampened rug. He smiled triumphantly at Woods. Looks a bit better now, don't you think? I don't think anything. Woods shook his head. A hundred pounds for an old medical kit. A very old medical kit, said Kane. Dates back to the 80s, if I'm not mistaken. Even so, I hardly see. Of course you wouldn't. I doubt if anyone besides myself would attach much significance to the name of J. Ridley, M.D. Never heard of him. That's understandable. Kane smiled. He preferred to call himself Jack the Ripper. Jack the Ripper. Surely you know the case. Whitechapel, 1888. The savage slaying and mutilation of prostitutes by a cunning mass murderer who taunted the police. A shadow stalking his prey in the streets. Woods frowned. But he was never caught, was he? Not even identified. In that, you're mistaken. No murderer has been identified quite as frequently as Red Jack. At the time of the crimes and over the years since, a score of suspects were named. A prime candidate was the Pole, Klazowski, alias George Chapman, who killed several wives, but poison was his method and gain his motive whereas the Ripper's victims were all penniless prostitutes who died under the knife. Another convicted murderer, Neil Cream, even openly proclaimed he was the Ripper. Wouldn't that be the answer then? Kane shrugged. Unfortunately, Cream happened to be in America at the time of the Ripper murders. Egomania prompted his false confession. He shook his head. Then there was John Pizer, a bookbinder known by the nickname of Leather Apron. He was actually arrested, but quickly cleared and released. Some think the killings were the work of a Russian called Gano Valov, who also went by the name of Perechenko and worked 
as a barber's surgeon. Supposedly, he was a czarist secret agent who perpetrated the slayings to discredit the British police. Sounds pretty far-fetched, if you ask me. Exactly, Kane smiled. But there are other candidates equally improbable. Montague John Truitt, for one, a barrister of unsound mind who drowned himself in the Thames shortly after the last Ripper murder. Unfortunately, it has been established that he was living in Bournemouth and on the days before and after the final slaying, he was there playing cricket. Then there was the Duke of Clarence. Who? Queen Victoria's grandson in direct line of succession to the throne. Surely, you're not serious. No, but others are. It has been asserted that Clarence was a known deviant who suffered from insanity as the result of venereal infection and that his death in 1892 was actually due to the ravages of his disease. But that doesn't prove him to be the Ripper. Quite so. It hardly seems possible that he could write the letters filled with Americana slang on crude errors in grammar on spelling which the Ripper sent to the authorities. Letters containing information which could be known only by the murderer and the police. More to the point, Clarence was in Scotland at the time of one of the killings and at Sandringham when others took place. And there are equally firm reasons for exonerating suggested suspects close to him. His friend James Stephen and his physician Sir William Gull. You've really studied up on this, Woods murmured. I'd no idea you were so keen on it. And for good reason, I wasn't about to make a fool of myself by advancing an untenable notion. I don't believe the Ripper was a seaman, as some surmise, for there's not a scintilla of evidence to back the theory. Nor do I think the Ripper was a slaughterhouse worker, a midwife, a man disguised as a woman, or a London bobby. And I doubt the very existence of a mysterious physician named Dr. Stanley out to avenge himself against the woman who had infected him or his son. But there do seem to be a great number of medical men amongst the suspects, Woods said. Right you are, and for good reason. Consider the nature of the crimes, the swift and skillful removal of vital organs accomplished in the darkness of the streets under constant danger of imminent discovery. All this implies the discipline of someone versed in anatomy, someone with the cool nerves of a practicing surgeon. Then too, there's the matter of escaping detection. The Ripper obviously knew the alleys and byways of the East End so thoroughly that he could slip through police cordons on patrols without discovery. But if seen, who would have a better alibi than a respectable physician carrying a medical bag on an emergency call late at night? With that in mind, I set about my search, examining the roles of London Hospital in Whitechapel Road. I went over the names of physicians and surgeons listed 
in the medical registry for that period. All of them. It wasn't necessary. I knew what I was looking for. A surgeon who lived unpracticed in the immediate Whitechapel area. Whenever possible, I followed up with a further investigation of my suspect's histories, researching hospital and clinical affiliations, even hobbies and background activities from medical journals, press reports, and family records. Of course, all this takes a great deal of time and patience. I must have been tilting at this windmill for a good five years before I found my man. Woods glanced at the nameplate on the bag. J. Ridley, M.D. John Ridley, Jack, to his friends, if he had any. Kane paused, thoughtful. But that's just the point. Ridley appears to have had no friends and no family. An orphan, he received his degree from Edinburgh in 1878, ten years before the date of the murders. He set up private practice here in London, but there is no office address listed, nor is there any further information to be found concerning him. It's as though he took particular care to suppress every detail of his personal and private life. This, of course, is what roused my suspicions. For an entire decade, J. Ridley lived and practiced in the East End without a single mention of his name anywhere in print except for his registry listing and after 1888 even that disappeared suppose he died there's no obituary on record woods shrugged perhaps he moved immigrated took sick abandoned practice then why the secrecy why conceal his whereabouts don't you see it's the very lack of such ordinary details which leads me to suspect the extraordinary but that's not evidence there's no proof that your dr ridley was the ripper that's why this is so important. Kane indicated the bag on the tabletop. If we knew its history, where it came from. As he spoke, Kane reached down and picked up a brass letter opener from the table, then moved to the bag. Wait. Woods put a restraining hand on Kane's shoulder. That may not be necessary. What do you mean? I think the shopkeeper was lying. He knew what the bag contains. He had to. Or else, why did he fix such a ridiculous price? He never dreamed you'd take him up on it, of course. But there's... No need for you to force the lock any more than there was for him to do so. My guess is that he has a key. You're right. Gain set the letter opener down. I should have realized if I'd taken the time to consider his reluctance. He must have the key. He lifted the shiny bag and turned. Come along, 
let's get back to him before the shop closes. And this time we won't be put off by any excuses. Dusk had descended as Cain and his companion hastened through the streets and darkness was creeping across the deserted silence of Saxe Coburg Square when they arrived. They halted then, staring into the shadows, seeking the spot where the shop nestled between the residences looming on either side. The shadows were deeper here, and they moved closer, only to stare again at the empty gap between the two buildings. The shop was gone. Woods blinked, then turned and gestured to gain. But we were here. We saw it. Gain didn't reply. He was staring at the dusty, rubble-strewn surface of the space between the structures at the weeds which sprouted from the bare ground beneath. A chill night wind echoed through the emptiness. Cain stooped and sifted a pinch of dust between his fingers. The dust was cold like the wind that whirled the fine grains from his hand and blew them away into the darkness. What happened? Woods was murmuring. Could we both have dreamed? Gain stood erect facing his friend. This isn't a dream, he said, gripping the black bag. Then what's the answer? I don't know. Kane frowned thoughtfully. But there's only one place where we can possibly find it. Where? The 1888 medical registry lists the address of John Ridley as number 17 Dorcas Lane. The cab which brought them to Dorcas Lane could not enter its narrow access way. The dim alley beyond was silent and empty, but Cain plunged into it without hesitation, moving along the dark passage between solid rows of grimy brick. Treading over the cobblestones, it seemed to Woods that he was being led into another era. Yet Cain's progress was swift and unfaltering. You've been here before, Woods said. Of course. Cain halted before the unlighted entrance to number 17, then knocked. The door opened, not fully, but just enough to permit the figure behind it to peer out at them. Both glance and greeting were guarded. What you want? Kane stepped into the fan of light from the partial opening. Good evening. Remember me? Yes. The door opened wider and Woods could see the squat shadow of the middle-aged woman who nodded up at his companion. You're the one what rented the back vacancy last bank holiday, ain't you? Right. I was wondering if I might have it again. I don't know. The woman glanced at Woods. Only for a few hours, Kane reached for his wallet. My friend and I have a business matter to discuss. Business, eh? 
Woods felt the unflattering appraisal of the landlady's beady eyes. Of course you are Fiverr. Here you are. A hand extended to grasp the note. Then the door opened fully, revealing the dingy hall and the stairs beyond. Mind the steps now, the landlady said. The stairs were steep and the woman was puffing as they reached the upper landing. She led them along the creaking corridor to the door at the rear, fumbling for the keys in her apron. Here we are. The door opened on musty darkness, scarcely dispelled by the faint illumination of the overhead fixture as she switched it on. The landlady nodded at Kane. I don't rent this for lodgings no more. It ain't properly made up. Quite all right. Kane smiled, his hand on the door. If there's anything you'll be needing, best tell me now. I've got to run over to the neighbor for a bit. She's been took ill. I'm sure we'll manage. Kane closed the door, then listened for a moment as the landlady's footsteps receded down the hall. Well, he said, what do you think? Woods surveyed the shabby room with its single window framed by yellowing curtains. He noted the faded carpet with its pattern well nigh worn away, the marred and chipped surfaces of the massive old bureau and heavy Moorish chair, the brass bed covered with a much mended spread, the ancient gas log in the fireplace framed by a cracked marble mantelpiece and the equally cracked washstand fixture in the corner. I think you're out of your mind, Wood said. Did I understand correctly that you've been here before? Exactly. I came several months ago as soon as I found the address in the registry. I wanted a look around. Woods wrinkled his nose. More to smell than there is to see. Use your imagination, man. Doesn't it mean anything to you that you're standing in the very room once occupied by Jack the Ripper? Woods shook his head. There must be a dozen rooms to let in this old barn. What makes you think this is the right one? The registry entry specified rear and there are no rear accommodations downstairs. That's where the kitchen is located. So this has to be the place. Kane gestured. Think of it. You may be looking at the very sink where the ripper washed away the traces of his butchery. The bed in which he slept after his dark deeds were performed. Who knows what sights this room has seen and heard the voice crying out in a tormented nightmare. Come off of it, Hillary, Woods grimaced impatiently. It's one thing to use your imagination, but quite another to let your imagination use you. Look, Kane pointed to the far corner of the room. Do you see those indentations in the carpet? I noticed them when I examined this room on my previous visit. What do they suggest to you? 
Woods peered dutifully at the worn surface of the carpet, noting the four round, evenly spaced marks. Must have been another piece of furniture in that corner. Something heavy, I'd say. But what sort of furniture? Well, Woods considered, judging from the space, it wasn't a sofa or chair. Could have been a cabinet, perhaps a large desk. Exactly, a roll-top desk. Every doctor had one in those days. Kane sighed. Oh, I'd give a pretty penny to know what became of that item. It might have held the answer to all our questions. After all these years, not bloody likely, Woods glanced away. Didn't find anything else, did you? I'm afraid not. As you see, it's been a long time since the Ripper stayed here. I didn't see that. Woods shook his head. You may be right about the desk. And no doubt the medical registry gives a correct address. But all it means is that this room may once have been rented by a Dr. John Ridley. You've already inspected it once. Why bother to come back? Because now I have this. Cain placed the black bag on the bed. On this, he produced a pocket knife. You intend to force the lock after all. In the absence of a key, I have no alternative. Kane wedged the blade under the metal guard and began to pry upwards. It's important that the bag be opened here. Something it contains may very well be associated with this room. If we recognize the connection, we might have an additional clue, a conclusive link. The lock snapped. As the bog sprang open, the two men stared down at its contents. The jumble of vials and pill boxes, the clumsy old style stethoscope, the probes and tweezers, the roll of gauze, and Resting atop it, the scalpel with the steel-tipped surface encrusted with brownish stains. They were still staring as the door opened quietly behind them and the balding, elderly little man entered the room. I see my guess was correct, gentlemen. You too have read the medical registry. He nodded. I was hoping I'd find you here. Kane frowned. What do you want? I'm afraid I must trouble you for my bag. But it's my property now. I bought it. The little man sighed. Yes, and I was a fool to permit it. I thought putting on that price would dissuade you. How was I to know you were a collector like myself? Collector? Of curiosa pertaining to murder. The little man smiled. A pity you cannot see some of the memorabilia I've acquired. Not the commonplace items associated with your so-called 
Black Museum in Scotland Yard. But true rarities with historical significance. He gestured. The silver jar in which the notorious French sorceress La Voisin kept her poisonous ointments. The actual dirks which dispatched the unfortunate nephews of Richard III in the tower. Yes, even the poker responsible for the atrocious demise of Edward II at Berkeley Castle on the night of September 21st, 1327. I had quite a bit of trouble locating it until I realized the date was reckoned according to the old Julian calendar. Kane frowned impatiently. Who are you? What happened to that shop of yours? My name would mean nothing to you. As for the shop, let us say that it exists spatially and temporally as I do. When and where necessary for my purposes, by your current and limited understanding, you might call it a sort of time machine. Woods shook his head. You're not making sense. Ah, but I am. And very good sense, too. How else do you think I could pursue my interest so successfully unless I were free to travel in time? It is my particular pleasure to return to certain eras in this primitive past of yours, visiting the scenes of famous and infamous crimes and locating trophies for my collection. The shop, of course, is just something I used as a blind for this particular mission. It's gone now, and I shall be going too, just as soon as I retrieve my property. It happens to be the souvenir of a most unusual murder. You see? Kane nodded at Woods. I told you this bag belonged to the Ripper. Not so, said the little man. I already have the Ripper's murder weapon, which I retrieved directly after the slaying of his final victim on November 9th. 1888, and I can assure you that your Dr. Ridley was not Jack the Ripper, but merely and simply an eccentric surgeon. As he spoke, he edged toward the bed. No, you don't. Kane turned to intercept him, but he was already reaching for the bag. Let go of that. Kane shouted. The little man tried to pull away, but Kane's hand swooped down frantically into the open bag and clawed. Then it rose, gripping the scalpel. The little man yanked the bag away. Clutching it, he retreated as Kane bore down upon him furiously. Stop! Woods cried. Hurling himself forward, he stepped between the two men directly into the orbit of the descending blade. There was a gurgle, then a thud, as he fell. The scalpel clattered to the floor, slipping from Kane's nerveless fingers and coming to rest amidst the crimson stain that seeped and spread. The little man stooped and picked up the scalpel. Thank you, he said softly. You have given me what I came for. 
he dropped the weapon into the bag. Then he shimmered, shimmered, and disappeared. But Woods' body didn't disappear. Kane stared down at it, at the throat ripped open from ear to ear. He was still staring when they came and took him away. The trial, of course, was a sensation. It wasn't so much the crazy story Kane told as the fact that nobody could ever find the fatal weapon. It was a most unusual murder. Yours truly, Jack the Ripper, by Robert Block. I looked at the stage Englishman. He looked at me. Sir Guy Hollis, I asked. Indeed, have I the pleasure of addressing John Carmody, the psychiatrist. I nodded. My eyes swept over the figure of my distinguished visitor, tall, lean, sandy-haired, with the traditional tufted mustache and the tweeds. I suspected a monocle concealed in a vest pocket and wondered if he'd left his umbrella in the outer office. But more than that, I wondered what the devil had impaled Sir Guy Hollis of the British Embassy to seek out a total stranger here in Chicago. Sir Guy didn't help matters any as he sat down. He cleared his throat, glanced around nervously, tapped his pipe against the side of the desk, then he opened his mouth. Mr. Carl Moody, he said, have you ever heard of Jack the Ripper? The murderer, I asked. Exactly. The greatest monster of them all. Worse than spring Jack or Crippen. Jack the Ripper. Red Jack. I've heard of him, I said. Do you know his history? Listen, Sir Guy, I muttered. I don't think we'll get any place swapping old wives' tales about famous crimes of history. Another bullseye. He took a deep breath. This is no old wives' tale. It's a matter of life or death. He was so wrapped up in his obsession, he even talked that way. Well, I was willing to listen. We psychiatrists get paid for listening. Go ahead, I told him. Let's have the story. So guy lit a cigarette and began to talk. London, 1888. He began, late summer and early fall, that was the time. Out of nowhere came the shadowy figure of Jack the Ripper, the stalking shadow with a knife, prowling through London's east end, haunting the squalid dives of Whitechapel, Spitalfields. Where he came from, no one knew, but he brought death, death in a knife. Six times that knife descended to slash the throats and bodies of London's women. Drabs and alley slopes. August 7 was the date of the first butchery. They found her body lying there with 39 stab wounds, a ghastly murder. On August 31st, another victim. The press became interested. The slum inhabitants were more deeply interested still. Who was this unknown killer who prowled in their midst and struck at will in the deserted alleyways of night town? And what was more important, when would he strike again? September 8th was the date. Scotland Yard signed special deputies. Rumors ran rampant. The atrocious nature of the slayings was a subject for shock and speculation. The killer used a knife expertly. He cut throats and removed 
certain portions of the bodies after death. He chose victims and settings with a fiendish deliberation. No one saw him or heard him. The watchmen, making their gray rounds in the dawn, would stumble across the hacked and hard thing that was the Ripper's handiwork. Who was he? What was he? A mad surgeon? A butcher? An insane scientist? Pathological degenerate escape from an asylum? A deranged nobleman? A member of the London police? Then, the poem appeared in the newspaper. The anonymous poem, designed to put a stop to speculations, but which only aroused public interest to a further frenzy, a mocking little stanza. I'm not a butcher, I'm not a yid, nor yet a foreign skipper, but I'm your own true loving friend, yours truly, Jack the Ripper. And on September 30th, two more throats were slashed open. I interrupted Sir Guy for a moment. Very interesting, I commented. I'm afraid a faint hint of sarcasm crept into my voice. He winced, but didn't falter in his narrative. There was silence. Then, in London for a time, silence and a nameless fear. When would Red Jack strike again? They waited through October. Every figment of fog concealed his phantom presence, concealed it well. But nothing was learned of the Ripper's identity or his purpose. The drabs of London shivered in the raw wind of early November. Shivered and were thankful for the coming of each morning's sun. November 9th, they found her in her room. She lay there very quietly, limbs neatly arranged. And beside her, with equal neatness, who laid her head and heart. The Ripper had outdone himself in execution. In panic, but needless panic. For though press, police, and populace alike awaited in sick dread, Jack the Ripper did not strike again. Months passed. A year. The immediate interest died, but not the memory. They said Jack had skipped to America, that he had committed suicide. They said, and they wrote. They've written ever since. Theories, hypotheses, arguments, treatises. But to this day, no one knows who Jack the Ripper was or why he killed, or why he stopped killing. Chagar was silent. Obviously, he expected some comment from me. You tell the story well, I remarked. Though, with a slight emotional bias, I've got all the documents, said Chagar Hollis. I've made a collection of existing data and studied it. I stood up. Well, oh, I yawned in mock fatigue. I've enjoyed your little bedtime story a great deal, Sir Guy. It was kind of you to abandon your duties at the British Embassy to drop in on a poor psychiatrist and regale him with your anecdotes. Goading him always did the trick. I suppose you want to know why I'm interested, he snapped. Yes. That's exactly what I'd like to know. Why are you interested? Because, said Sir Guy Hollis, I'm on the trail of Jack the Ripper now. I think he's here, in Chicago. I sat down again. This time, I did the blinking act. S -s -s Say that again? I stuttered. 
Jack the Ripper is alive in Chicago, and I'm out to find him. Wait a minute, I said. Wait a minute. He wasn't smiling. It wasn't a joke. See here, I said. What was the date of these murders? August to November, 1888. 1888? But if Jack the Ripper was an able-bodied man in 1888, he'd surely be dead today. Why look, man, if he were merely born in that year, he'd be 57 years old today. Would he? Smiled Sir Guy Hollis. Or should I say, would she? Because Jack the Ripper may have been a woman, or any number of things. Sir Guy, I said, you came to the right person when you looked me up. You definitely need the services of a psychiatrist. Perhaps. Tell me, Mr. Carmody, do you think I'm crazy? I looked at him and shrugged, but I had to give him a truthful answer. Frankly? No. Then, you might listen to the reasons I believe Jack the Ripper is alive today. I might. I've studied these cases for 30 years. Been over the actual ground. Talked to officials. Talked to friends and acquaintances of the poor drabs who were killed. Visited with men and women in the neighborhood. Collected an entire library of material touching on Jack the Ripper. Studied all the wild theories or crazy notions. I learned a little, not much, but a little. I won't bore you with my conclusions. But there was another branch of inquiry that yielded more fruitful return. I have studied unsolved crimes, murders. I could show you clippings from the papers of half the world's great cities. San Francisco, Shanghai, Calcutta, Amps, Paris, Berlin, Pretoria. Cairo, Milan, Adelaide. The trail is there, the pattern. Unsolved crimes, slashed throats of women with the peculiar disfigurations and removals. Yes, I followed a trail of blood from New York westward across the continent, then to the Pacific, from there to Africa. During the World War, 1914 18 it was Europe after that South America and since 1930 the United States again 87 such murders and to the trained criminologists all bear the stigma of the Ripper's handiwork recently there were the so-called Cleveland torso slings. Remember? A shocking series. And finally, two recent deaths in Chicago within the past six months. One out on South Dearborn, the other somewhere up on Halsted. Same type of crime, same technique. I tell you, there are unmistakable indications in all these affairs indications of the work of Jack the Ripper. I smiled. Very tight theory, I said. I'm not questioning your evidence at all or the deductions you draw. You're the criminologist and I'll take your word for it. Just one thing remains to be explained. A minor point, perhaps, but worth mentioning. And what is that? asked Sir Guy. Just how could a man of, let us say, 85 years commit these crimes? For if Jack the Ripper was around 30 in 1888 and lived, he'd be 85 today. Sir Guy Hollis was silent. Add him there. But 
Suppose he didn't get any older, whispered Sir Guy. What's that? Suppose Jack the Ripper didn't grow old. Suppose he is still a young man today. All right, I said. I'll suppose for a moment. Then I'll stop supposing and call for my nurse to restrain you. I'm serious, said Sir Guy. They all are, I told him. That's the pity of it all, isn't it? They know they hear voices and see demons, but we lock them up just the same. It was cruel, but it got results. He rose and faced me. It's a crazy theory, I grant you, he said. All the theories about the Ripper are crazy. The idea that he was a doctor, or a maniac, or a woman. The reasons advanced for such beliefs are flimsy enough. There is nothing to go by. So why should my notion be any worse? Because people grow older. I reasoned with him. Doctors, maniacs, and women alike. What about sorcerers? Sorcerers? Necromancers, wizards, practices of black magic. What's the point? I studied, said Sir God. I studied everything. After a while, I began to study the dates of the murders. The pattern those dates formed, the rhythm, the solar, lunar, stellar rhythm, the sidereal aspect, the astrological significance. He was crazy, but I still listened. Suppose Jack the Ripper didn't murder for murder's sake alone. Suppose he wanted to make a sacrifice. What kind of sacrifice? So Guy shrugged. It is said that if you offer blood to the dark gods that they grant boons. Yes, if a blood offering is made at the proper time when the moon and the stars are right and with the proper ceremonies. They grant boons, boons of youth, eternal youth. But that's nonsense. No, that's Jack the Ripper. I stood up. A most interesting theory, I told him. But Sir Guy, there's just one thing I'm interested in. Why do you come here and tell it to me? I'm not an authority on witchcraft. I'm not a police official or criminologist. I'm a practicing psychiatrist. What's the connection? Sir Guy smiled. You are interested then. Well, yes, there must be some point. There is, but I wished to be assured of your interest first. Now, I can tell you my plan. And just what is this plan? So Guy gave me a long look. Then he spoke. John Carmoody. He said, you and I are going to capture Jack the Ripper. That's the way it happened. I've given the gist of that first interview in all its intricate and somewhat boring detail, because I think it's important. It helps to throw some light on Sir Guy's character and attitude. And in view of what happened after that, but I'm coming to those matters. Sir Guy's thought was simple. It wasn't even a thought, just a hunch. You know the people here, he told me. I've inquired. That's why I came to you as the ideal man for my purpose. You number amongst your acquaintances many writers, painters, poets, 
the so-called intelligentsia, the bohemians, the lunatic fringe from the near north side. For certain reasons, never mind what they are. My clues lead me to infer that Jack the Ripper is a member of that element. He chooses to pose as an eccentric. I have a feeling that with you to take me around and introduce me to your set, I might hit upon the right person. It's all right with me, I said. But just how are you going to look for him? As you say, he might be anybody, anywhere. And you have no idea what he looks like. He might be young or old. Jack the Ripper, a jack of all trades. Rich man, poor man, beggar man, thief, doctor, lawyer. How will you know? We shall see. So guy sighed heavily. But I must find him at once. Why the hurry? So guy sighed again. Because in two days, he will kill again. Are you sure? Sure as the stars. I plotted this chart, you see. All of the murders correspond to certain astrological rhythm patterns. If, as I suspect, he makes a blood sacrifice to renew his youth, he must murder within two days. Notice the pattern of his first crimes in London, August 7th, then August 31st, September 8th, September 30th, November 9th, intervals of 24 days, 9 days, 22 days. He killed two this time, and then 40 days. Of course, there were crimes in between. There had to be. But they weren't discovered and pinned on him. At any rate, I've worked out a pattern for him based on all my data. And I say that within the next two days, he kills. So I must seek him out somehow before then. And I'm still asking you, what you want me to do? Take me out, said Sir Guy. Introduce me to your friends. Take me to parties. But where do I begin? As far as I know, my artistic friends, despite their eccentricities, are all normal people. So is the Ripper. Perfectly normal, except on certain nights. Again, that faraway look in Sir Guy's eyes. Then he becomes an ageless, pathological monster crouching to kill on evenings when the stars blaze down in the blazing patterns of death. All right, I said, all right. I'll take you to parties, Sir Guy. I wanna go myself anyway. I need the drinks, they'll serve there after listening to your kind of talk. We made our plans and that evening I took him over to Lester Baston's studio. As we ascended to the penthouse roof in the elevator, I took the opportunity to warn Sir Guy. Baston's a real screwball, I cautioned him. Sorry's guest, be prepared for anything and everything. I am, Sir Guy was perfectly serious. He put his hand in his trousers pocket and pulled out a gun. What the? I began. If I see him, I'll be ready, Sir Guy said. He didn't smile either. But you can't go running around at a party with a loaded revolver in your pocket, man. Don't worry. I won't behave foolishly. I wondered. Sir Guy Hollis was not, to my way of thinking, 
a normal man. We stepped out of the elevator, went toward Baston's apartment door. By the way, I murmured, just how do you wish to be introduced? Shall I tell him who you are and what you are looking for? I don't care. Perhaps it would be best to be frank. But don't you think that the Ripper, if by some miracle he or she is present, will immediately get the wind up and take cover? I think the shock of the announcement that I am hunting the Ripper will provoke some kind of betraying gesture on his part, said Sir Guy. You'd make a pretty good psychiatrist yourself, I conceded. It's a fine theory, but I warn you, you're going to be in for a lot of ribbing. This is a wild bunch. Sir Guy smiled. I'm ready, he announced. I have a little plan of my own. Don't be shocked at anything I do, he warned me. I nodded and knocked on the door. Baston opened it and poured out into the hall. His eyes were as red as the maraschino cherries in his Manhattan. He teetered back and forth regarding us very gravely. He squinted at my square-cut Hamburg hat and Sir Guy's mustache. Aha, he intoned, the walrus and the carpenter. I introduced Sir Guy. Welcome, said Bastion. Gesturing us inside with over-elaborate courtesy, he stumbled after us into the garish parlor. I stared at the crowd that moved restlessly through the fog of cigarette smoke. It was the shank of the evening for this mob. Every hand held a drink. Every face held a slight, hectic flush. Over in one corner, the piano was going full blast, but the imperious strains of the march from the love for the three oranges couldn't drown out the profanity from the crack game in the other corner. Brokofeef had no chance against African polo, and one set of ivories rattled louder than the other. So Guy got a monocle full right away. He saw Laverne Gonister, the poetist, hit Jaime Kralik in the eye. He saw Jaime sit down on the floor and cry until Dick Poole accidentally stepped on his stomach as he walked through to the dining room for a drink. He heard Nadia Villanoff, the commercial artist, tell Johnny Oddcut that she thought his tattooing was in dreadful taste. And he saw Barkley Melton crawl under the dining room table with Johnny Oddcut's wife. His zoological observations might have continued indefinitely if Lester Baston hadn't stepped to the center of the room and called for silence by dropping a vase on the floor. We have distinguished visitors in our midst, bawled Lester, waving his empty glass in our direction. None other than the walrus and the carpenter. The walrus is Sir Guy Hollis, a something or other from the British Embassy. The carpenter, as you know, is our own John Carmody, the prominent dispenser of libido liniment. He turned and grabbed Sir Guy by the arm, dragging him to the middle of the carpet. For a moment, I thought Hollis might object, but a quick wink reassured me. He was prepared for this. It is our custom, Sir Guy, said Baston loudly, to subject our new friends to a little cross-examination. Just a little formality at these very informal gatherings, you understand. Are you prepared to answer questions? The guy nodded and grinned. Very well, Baston muttered. Friends, I give you this bundle from Britain, your witness. Then the ribbing started. I meant to listen, but at that moment, Lydia Dare saw me and dragged me off into the vestibule. One of those, darling, I waited for your call all day routines. By the time I got rid of her and went back, 
The impromptu quiz session was in full swing. From the attitude of the crowd, I gathered that Sir Guy was doing all right for himself. Then Bastin himself interjected, a question that upset the apple cart. And what, may I ask, brings you to our midst tonight? What is your mission, O oh walrus? I'm looking for Jack the Ripper. Nobody laughed. Perhaps it struck them all the way it did me. I glanced at my neighbors and began to wonder. Laverne Gonister, Jaime Kralik, Harmless, Dick Poole, Nadia Villanoff, Johnny Odka and his wife, Barkley Melton, Lydia Dare, all harmless. But what a forced smile on Dick Poole's face. And that sly, self-conscious smirk that Barkley Melton wore. Oh, it was absurd, I grant you. But for the first time, I saw these people in a new light. I wondered about their lives, their secret lives, beyond the scenes of parties. How many of them were playing a part, concealing something. Who here would worship a Hakate and grant that horrid goddess the dark boon of blood? Even Lester Baston might be masquerading. The mood was upon us all for a moment. I saw questions flicker in the circle of eyes around the room. Sir Guy stood there and I could swear he was fully conscious of the situation he'd created and enjoyed it. I wondered idly just what was really wrong with him. Why he had this odd fixation concerning Jack the Ripper. Maybe he was hiding secrets too. Aston, as usual, broke the mood. He burlesqued it. The walrus isn't kidding, friends, he said. He slapped Sir Guy on the back and put his arm around him as he orated. Our English cousin is really on the trail of the fabulous Jack the Ripper. You all remember Jack the Ripper, I presume? Quite a cut up in the old days, as I recall. Really had some ripping good times when he went out on a tear. The walrus has some idea that the Ripper is still alive, probably prowling around Chicago with a Boy Scout knife. In fact, Bastin paused impressively and shot it out in a rasping stage whisper. In fact, he has reason to believe that Jack the Ripper might even be right here in our midst tonight. There was the expected reaction of giggles and grins. Bastin eyed Lydia Dare reprovingly. You girls needn't laugh, he smirked. Jack the Ripper might be a woman too. You know, sort of a Jill the Ripper. You mean you actually suspect one of us? Shrieked. Laverne Gonister, simpering up to Sir Guy. But that Jack the Ripper person disappeared ages ago, didn't he? In 1888? Aha! Interrupted Baston. How do you know so much about it, young lady? Sounds suspicious. Watch her, Sir Guy. She may not be as young as she appears. These lady poets have dark past. The tension was gone. The mood was shattered, and the whole thing was beginning to degenerate into a trivial party joke. The man who had played the march was eyeing the piano with a scurzo gleam in his eye that augured ill for Prokofiev. Lydia Dare was glancing at the kitchen, waiting to make a break for another drink. Then Bastin caught it. Guess what? He yelled. The walrus has a gun. His embracing arm slipped and encountered the hard outline of the gun in Sir Guy's pocket. He snatched it out, and before Hollis had the opportunity to protest, I stared hard at Sir Guy, wondering if this thing had carried far enough. But he flicked a wink my way, and I remembered he had told me not to be alarmed. 
so I waited as Baston broached a drunken inspiration. Let's play fair with our friend the walrus, he cried. He came all the way from England to our party on this mission. If none of you is willing to confess, I suggest we give him a chance to find out the hard way. What's up? asked Johnny Oddcut. I'll turn out the lights for one minute. Sir Guy can stand here with his gun. If anyone in this room is the Ripper, he can either run for it or take the opportunity to, well, eradicate his pursuer. Fair enough. It was even sillier than it sounds, but it caught the popular fancy. Sir Guy's protest went unheard in the ensuing babble. Before I could stride over and put in my two cents worth, Lester Baston had reached the light switch. Don't anybody move, he announced with fake solemnity. For one minute, we will remain in darkness, perhaps at the mercy of a killer. At the end of that time, I'll turn up the lights again and look for bodies. Choose your partners, ladies and gentlemen. The lights went out. Somebody giggled. I heard footsteps in the darkness, mutterings. A hand brushed my face. The watch on my wrist ticked violently, but even louder. Rising above it, I heard another thumping. The beating of my heart. Absurd standing in the dark with a group of tipsy fools and yet there was real terror lurking here rustling through the velvet blackness jack the ripper prowled in darkness like this and jack the ripper had a knife jack the ripper had a madman's brain and a madman's purpose but jack the ripper was dead dead in dust these many years by every human law only there are no human laws when you feel yourself in the darkness, when the darkness hides and protects and the outer mask slips off your face and you feel something welling up within you, a brooding shapeless purpose that is brother to the blackness. Sir Guy Hollis shrieked. There was a grisly thud. Baston had the lights on. Everybody screamed. Sir Guy Hollis lay sprawled on the floor in the center of the room. The gun was still clutched in his hand. I glanced at the faces, marveling at the variety of expressions human beings can assume when confronting horror. All the faces were present in the circle. Nobody had fled, and yet Sir Guy Hollis lay there. Laverne Gonister was wailing and hiding her face. All right. Sir Guy rolled over and jumped to his feet. He was smiling. Just an experiment, eh? Jack the Ripper were among those present and thought I had been murdered. He would have betrayed himself in some way when the lights went on and he saw me lying there. I am convinced of your individual and collective innocence. Just a gentle spoof, my friends. Hollis stared at the goggling bastard and the rest of them crowding in behind him. Shall we leave, John? He called to me. It's getting late, I think. Turning, he headed for the closet. I followed him. Nobody said a word. It was a pretty dull party after that. I met Sir Guy the following evening as we agreed on the corner of 29th and South Houston. After what had happened the night before, I was prepared for almost anything. But Sir Guy seemed matter of fact enough as he stood huddled against a grimy doorway and waited for me to appear. Boo, I said. Jumping out suddenly, he smiled. Only the betraying gesture of his left hand indicated that he instinctively reached for his gun when I startled him. 
All ready for our wild goose chase? I asked. Yes, he nodded. I'm glad that you agreed to meet me without asking questions, he told me. It shows you trust my judgment. He took my arm and edged me along the street slowly. It's foggy tonight, John, said Sir Guy Hollis. Like London. I nodded. Cold, too, for November. I nodded again and half shivered my agreement. Curious, mused Sir Guy. London fall and November. The place and the time of the Ripper murders. I grinned through darkness. Let me remind you, Sir Guy, that this isn't London but Chicago, and it isn't November, 1888. It's over 50 years later. Sagai returned my grin, but without mirth. I'm not so sure at that, he murmured. Look about you, these tangled alleys and twisted streets. They're like the East End. Mitra Square, and surely they are as ancient as 50 years at least. You're in the colored neighborhood of South Clark Street, I said shortly, and why you drag me down here, I still don't know. It's a hunch, Sir Guy admitted, just a hunch on my part, John. I wanna wander around down here. There's the same geographical confirmation in these streets as in those courts where the Ripper roamed and slew. That's where we'll find him, John. Not in the bright lights of the Bohemian neighborhood, but down here in the darkness. The darkness where he waits and crouches. Is that why you brought a gun? I asked. I was unable to keep a trace of sarcastic nervousness from my voice. All of this talk, this incessant obsession with Jack the Ripper, got on my nerves more than I cared to admit. We may need a gun, said Sir Guy gravely. After all, tonight is the appointed night. I sighed. <sighs> we wandered on through the foggy, deserted streets. Here and there, a dim light burned above a gin mill doorway. Otherwise, all was darkness and shadow. Deep, gaping alleyways loomed as we proceeded down a slanting side street. We crawled through that fog, alone and silent, like two tiny maggots floundering within a shroud. When that thought hit me, I winced. The atmosphere was beginning to get me, too. If I didn't watch my step, I'd go as loony as Sir Guy. Can't you see? There's not a soul around these streets, I said, tugging at his coat impatiently. He's bound to come, said Sir Guy. He'll be drawn here. This is what I've been looking for, a genius loci. An evil spot that attracts evil. Always when he slays, it's in the slums. You see, that must be one of his weaknesses. He has a fascination for squalor. Besides, the women he needs for sacrifice are more easily found in the dives and stewpots of a great city. I smiled. Well, let's go into one of the dives or stew pots, I suggested. I'm cold. Need a drink. This damn fog gets into your bones. You Britishers can stand it, but I like warmth and dry heat. We emerged from our side street and stood upon the threshold of an alley. Through the white clouds of mist ahead, I discerned a dim blue light. 
a naked bulb dangling from a beer sign above an alley tavern. Let's take a chance, I said. I'm beginning to shiver. Lead the way, said Sir Guy. I led him down the alley passage. We halted before the door of the dive. What are you waiting for? He asked. I'm just looking in, I told him. This is a tough neighborhood, Sir Guy. Never know what you're liable to run into. And I prefer we didn't get into the wrong company. Some of these Negro places resent white customers. Good idea, John. I finished my inspection through the doorway. Looks deserted, I murmured. Let's try it. We entered a dingy bar. A feeble light flickered above the counter and railing, but failed to penetrate the further gloom of the back booths. A gigantic Negro lolled across the bar, a black giant with prognathous jaw and ape-like torso. He scarcely stirred as we came in, but his eyes flicked open quite suddenly, and I knew he noted our presence and was judging us. Evening. I said. He took his time before replying, still sizing us up. Then he grinned. Evening, gents. What's your pleasure? Gin, I said. Two gins. It's a cold night. That's right, gents. He poured, I paid, and took the glasses over to one of the booths. We wasted no time in emptying them. The fiery liquor warmed. I went over to the bar and got the bottle. Sir Guy and I poured ourselves another drink. The big Negro went back into his doze with one wary eye half open against any sudden activity. The clock over the bar ticked on. The wind was rising outside, tearing the shroud of fog to ragged shreds. Sir Guy and I sat in the warm booth and drank our gin. We began to talk, and the shadows crept up about us to listen. He rambled a great deal. He went over everything he'd said in the office when I met him, just as though I hadn't heard it before. The poor devils with obsessions are like that. I listened very patiently. I poured Sir Guy another drink and another. But the liquor only made him more talkative. How he did run on about ritual killings and prolonging the life unnaturally. The whole fantastic tale came out again. And of course, he maintained his unyielding conviction that the Ripper was abroad tonight. I suppose I was guilty of goading him very well, I said, unable to keep the impatience from my voice. Let us say that your theory is correct, even though we must overlook every natural law and swallow a lot of superstition to give it any credence. But let us say, for the sake of argument, that you are right. Jack the Ripper was a man who discovered how to prolong his own life through making human sacrifices. He did travel around the world, as you believe. He is in Chicago now, and he is planning to kill. In other words, let us suppose that everything you claim is gospel truth. So what? What do you mean, so what? Said Sir Guy. I mean, so what? I answered. If all this is true, it still doesn't prove that by sitting down in a dingy gin mill on the south side, Jack the Ripper is going to walk in here and let you kill him or turn him over to the police. Now come to think of it, I don't even know now just what you intend to do with him if you ever did find him. So Guy gulped his gin. I'd capture bloody swine, he said. Capture him and turn him over to the government, together with all the papers and documentary evidence are collected against him over a period of many years. 
I've spent a fortune investigating this affair. I tell you, a fortune. This capture will mean the solution of hundreds of unsolved crimes. Of that I am convinced. I tell you, a mad beast is loose on this world. An ageless, eternal beast sacrificing to Hakate and the Dark Gods. In vino, varietas, or was all this babbling the result of too much gin? It didn't matter. Sir Guy Hollis had another. I sat there and wondered what to do with him. The man was rapidly working up to a climax of hysterical drunkenness. One other point, I said, more for the sake of conversation than in any hopes of obtaining information. You still don't explain how it is that you hope to just blunder into the Ripper. He'll be around, said Sir Guy. I'm psychic, I know. Sir Guy wasn't psychic. He was maudlin. The whole business was beginning to infuriate me. We'd been sitting here an hour, and during all this time, I'd been forced to play nursemaid and audience to a babbling idiot. After all, he wasn't a regular patient of mine. That's enough, I said, putting out my hand as Sir Guy reached for the half-empty bottle again. You've had plenty. Now I've got a suggestion to make. Let's call a cab and get out of here. It's getting late, and it doesn't look as though your elusive friend is going to put in his appearance. Tomorrow, if I were you, I'd plan to turn all those papers and documents over to the FBI. If you're so convinced of the truth of your wild theory, they are competent to make a very thorough investigation and find your man. No. Sir Guy was drunkenly obstinate. No cab. Let's get out of here anyway, I said, glancing at my watch. It's past midnight. He sighed, shrugged, and rose unsteadily. As he started for the door, he tugged the gun free from his pocket. Here, give me that, I whispered. You can't walk around the street brandishing that thing. I took the gun and slipped it inside my coat, and I got hold of his right arm and steered him out of the door. The Negro didn't look up as we departed. We stood shivering in the alleyway. The fog had increased. I couldn't see either end of the alley from where we stood. It was cold, damp, dark, fog or no fog, a little wind was whispering secrets to the shadows at our backs. The fresh air hit Sir Guy just as I expected it would. Fog and gin fumes don't mingle very well. He lurched as I guided him slowly through the mist. Sir Guy, despite his incapacity, still stared apprehensively at the alley, as though he expected to see a figure approaching. Disgust got the better of me. Childish foolishness, I snorted. Jack the Ripper indeed. I call this carrying a hobby too far. Hobby? He faced me. Through the fog, I could see his distorted face. You call this a hobby? Well, what is it? I grumbled. Just why else are you so interested in tracking down this mythical killer? My arm held his, but his stare held me. In London, he whispered, in 1888, one of those nameless drabs the Ripper slew was my mother. What? Later, I was recognized by my father and legitimized. We swore to give our lives to find the Ripper. My father was the first to search. He died in Hollywood in 1926 on the trail of the Ripper. They said he was stabbed.
by an unknown assailant in a brawl. But I know who that assailant was. So I've taken up his work. Do you see, John? I've carried on, and I will carry on until I do find him and kill him with my own hands. He took my mother's life and the lives of hundreds to keep his own hellish being alive. Like a vampire, he battens on blood. Like a ghoul, he is nourished by death. Like a fiend, he stalks the world to kill. He is cunning, devilishly cunning, but I'll never rest until I find him, never. I believed him then, he wouldn't give up. He wasn't just a drunken blabber anymore. He was as fanatical, as determined, as relentless as the Ripper himself. Tomorrow, he'd be sober. He'd continue the search. Perhaps he'd turn those papers over to the FBI, sooner or later, with such persistence and with his motive, he'd be successful. I'd always known he had a motive. Let's go, I said, steering him down the alley. Wait a minute, said Sir Guy. Give me back my gun. He lurched a little. I'd feel better with the gun on me. He pressed me into the dark shadows of a little recess. I tried to shove him off, but he was insistent. Let me carry the gun now, John. He mumbled. All right, I said. I reached into my coat brought my hand out. But that's not a gun, he protested. That's a knife. I know. I bore down on him swiftly. John! He screamed. Never mind the John. I whispered, raising the knife. Just call me. Jack. Thank you for listening. Have a great night.